officially, I am the Reverend Dr. J.C. Richardson, uh, or Pastor J.C. Uh, that is uh, how I'm referred to in my clerical world, I guess. Um, and I am the, I like to say, servant senior pastor uh, of the historic Wesley United Methodist Church. Well, I've always been weird, really. I've, I've just recently owned my weirdness. Uh, but I've always been weird uh, when I grew up. Um, and uh, part of that weirdness was that I would, as I was growing up, would always ask uh, my parents uh, just questions that would make them say, oh my God, <laughs> this boy right here. I uh, asked my mom if she had one piece of bread. She had three kids. Uh, my parents were divorced at the time and she was uh, raising us uh, as a single mom. And uh, she paused for a second uh, and said, well, if I had one piece of bread, uh, who would I feed first? And I said, yeah, that's my question. And she said, I would feed myself first. And I was shocked at the answer because I thought, of course, she would feed us first. And she said, well, uh, I would eat a little bit of bread and, uh, and give you all the rest. Uh, and the simple fact uh, for that uh, was that uh, if I'm not strong, y'all don't have a chance. And so that was sort of a manifestation of my, my weirdness, if you were always asking questions that usually you don't hear uh, from uh, persons that age. I remember when I was 10 years old, uh, 8 or 10, something like that, so between 8 and 10, uh, my parents <coughs> uh, asked, would ask us questions just to make us think. And we were leaving church uh, at uh, one time, and uh, my, it was even my mom or my dad at the time, they were, they were married then, uh, asked, okay, what do you all like about the church service? And uh, being the only boy, middle child, that might be the reason why I'm weird, I'm the middle child, the only boy. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, they asked a the question uh, to all three of us. I have an older sister, a younger sister. And, uh, and my younger sister said, well, I like hanging out with my friends. Uh, and then my older sister uh, gave her answer, uh, which was, oh, I like the music because she sung in the choir. And then I gave my answer and I said, I like the preaching. Uh, and uh, so that was sort of a manifestation of my weirdness because they were shocked that someone my age would actually be uh, listening to the sermons, let alone engaged in them and like them and things of that sort. So uh, that is sort of a entry into uh, my journey uh, as far as calling. Uh, and uh, that uh, came to a point where I was sitting in church uh, and I was, I'll never forget, I was sitting at church and, <clears throat> and something, the preacher was preaching and I had my older sister Elizabeth beside me. I don't know where Andrew was, probably hanging out with her friends. Uh, and, uh, and I said to, something came over me. I can't, I can't really, I couldn't describe it at that time. And uh, I leaned over to Elizabeth, and my, Elizabeth is a very matter-of-fact person. You know those people who are very matter-of-fact, uh, don't ask them any questions if you don't want a real answer? Uh, she was one of those. So uh, I leaned over to her, and I said, I want to do that when I grow up. And my sister was very matter of fact and pointed and said to me, why in the world are you telling me? You need to go up and tell them. Why are you telling me this? You, don't, you need to go up and let them know, uh, idiot. <laughs> so uh, I stayed seated. I stayed seated. I thought it was hubris. I thought it was my desire to be in front of people and to entertain. And I knew at that time that... Uh, that being a preacher or a pastor was not something that is to be trifled with or played with. I knew at that time, I had a sense, I couldn't articulate it like I'm articulating it now, uh, but I had a sense that it was something that was not entertainment. So uh, I stayed seated because I think that at that time, uh, that was sort of a budding uh, tension that I still have today between my head and my heart. Uh, and my head told me to stay seated and questioned everything and this is, you just want to be in front of people, all of those type of things. So, uh, 
so I just stayed seated and I was 12 years old at the time. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so I stayed seated and I stayed seated for some time. For years I stayed seated uh, and continued on uh, and uh, studied mathematics uh, and you know, uh, engineering. Uh, and then when I was in college, it came uh, again, uh, the, the feeling that I had. Uh, I had a, I, since that time between 12 and, and I think I was 20, 21 at the time, uh, I had many uh, experiences. Uh, one would call it a crisis of faith. I was about to uh, convert to Islam at one point in time uh, and, and, and took that seriously and kind of compared the two faiths, uh, Islam and, and Christianity, and talked to an imam and talked to uh, a pastor or, or a, a, a pastor who was teaching in the religion department at the time. Uh, and so I've had that crossroads of, uh, you know, mama may have, papa may have, but God bless the child that has his own. I had to make that choice for myself. So I went through that uh, exercise and eventually uh, arrived at uh, the f making Jesus my choice. But at that time, uh, I, it wasn't, uh, the feeling wasn't there. It was more or less an academic intellectual exercise. I wanted to make a choice because I knew that faith was important. I knew I did believe in God. I just wanted to make sure that, uh, that I honored uh, the process in what some may call a risky way, right? I wasn't leaving the church, that's for sure. I wasn't leaving <clears throat> uh, sort of the religious world. Uh, but uh, it came after all of these uh, machinations and ups and downs and searching and seeking. Uh, and it came again. Uh, and it was interesting to me because when it came, I started questioning uh, again. Uh, but it was a different type of questioning uh, than I had when I was 12. Uh, the questioning that I had at that time uh, was sort of a more external questioning. Uh, <clears throat> my father was an attorney. I was talking to someone and I was saying, and he was a preacher, uh, a uh, frat brother of mine. Uh, he was a preacher. And I started talking to him about what I was feeling at the time. And I was given all of these uh, what amounted to excuses or rationales. Again, I was kind of thinking through these things, you know, again, that head and that heart tension and uh, and what would one would call discernment. I didn't have the word then, but now it would, it would, I would define it as discernment. And uh, I was saying, well, my father is a law professor, uh, a practicing attorney. My mom is in the health field, a social worker. I don't have any background. This is what I was telling. I don't have any background for being a preacher. Uh, and. Uh, I said to him, I said, your dad is a preacher, your uncle's a preacher, your granddad is a preacher, your brother's a preacher. So it kind of makes sense that you would be a preacher because you have all of this background that constitutes uh, some awareness or some familiarity with what it means to be clergy and a preacher uh, in your tradition. And he said to me something I will never forget. He said, well, maybe I needed this clerical pedigree in my background in order for my calling to manifest itself. Uh, and you don't. God has a way of providing people what they need and you may not need uh, all of this pedigree. Your daddy didn't need a preacher. God can call you regardless of your background uh, into the ministry. So. Uh, at that point in time, there was some peace there. But again, that tension between the head and the heart, <clears throat> sometimes my head gets in the way and has to run its course. So I continued to question and to the point where uh, I went to my pastor. Uh, the tradition uh, is, uh, uh, in the Methodist tradition, as one knows, one goes to one's pastor to kind of talk about your call to preach. So I went, followed that uh, process, uh, and I was in the uh, AME church at the time and went to my pastor, uh, Dr. Green, uh, and uh, talked to him and said, listen, I feel called to preach. And he said, okay, uh, we'll set up your trial sermon uh, because you got to go through a process. You have to have a trial sermon. And then uh, the people that are listening to your trial sermon, uh, it's, it's a church conference sort of, and they have to vote whether or not to uh, provide you a license to preach. And then, of course, you go to the next phase. Uh, and... Uh, and he told me in that meeting, uh, once I accepted the call to preach, 
uh, he said, well, if you're going to do this thing, you got to go all the way. And I'm paraphrasing here. He said, uh, he said we got too many jack leg preachers out there. Uh, too many. Uh, and he said, he said, if you're going to be a preacher, you got to be the best. You got to go to seminary. And in my mind, I was like, God, Lee, I have to go to seminary? I thought it was just my trial sermon, and I'm good. I get my license to preach. I just preached. I've answered my call. I'm good. I got to go to seminary now? And that just, that just threw me from uh, one uh, arena of contemplation and discernment to a whole nother arena of contemplation and discernment. Uh, now I have to say, okay, well, what is this, God, do you want me to go to seminary? Do you want me to kind of go a little bit further and not just be a preacher? Because I was all for just being a preacher. I was going to get my math degree, get my uh, degree in electrical engineering and, and do that as my full-time job. And then I'll, I would have been faithful to God and answering the call to preach. And therefore, I would have been preaching on the side and, and earning a whole lot more money on this side. So uh, as, a, as a mathematician and a, an electrical engineer, and I was like, well, now... I got to think about this whole seminary thing. So, so that just threw me into a whole nother arena of discernment. And, uh, and he, he, said, he said, you got to be the best. So I'm all about being the best. So I entered into prayer and, and, and I was just wrestling. I was, like, I was going from one wrestling to another. And because it, it had implications. Because if I was going to do this, if I was going to be the best, I'm going to go full tilt. I'm not going to just half weigh it. Uh, and, uh, and so I had to really be in, in prayer about that. Uh, I've accepted my call to preach, uh, but also the feeling would not leave. Uh, it continued to wrestle with me, and uh, the pastor, uh, rightly so, uh, contributed to that wrestling, and it got deeper and deeper. So I went back into prayer and contemplation uh, of uh, how far into this ministry and, uh, and, and clerical and clergy and, and, and vocation uh, I wanted to go. So uh, I said, well, uh, I started, again, going through all of my reads, again, that head and heart uh, tension, and I reached a point of resolution. I said, well, uh, I have to uh, apply for seminary. If I applied for seminary, uh, the place where I was staying, it was just for students. So I had to leave if I was to uh, leave my field of study. I, was, I had already achieved my BS in mathematics and I was, had a year left in studying for my electrical engineering uh, degree. So if I was going to go to seminary, I had to leave uh, a year early and not finish that degree uh, and go to seminary. Uh, and the place that I was staying, uh, the person that rented it to me said to me, point blank, I only rent to students. Once you stop school, you'll have to move out. So uh, I was saying, well, if I have to go to seminary, I have to stop my program, move out. Uh, I was working a job at the time. Uh, I was not uh, getting a lot of hours. Uh, and, and so therefore, I didn't know how I was going to pay for this new place and, and all of the bills that come with that. Uh, and all of these things started going through my mind. Uh, as I was contemplating and discerning the call uh, and or this next level of the call or whether or not I was going to go to seminary. And, and one Sunday, one Sunday, I'll never forget, I was wrestling. I was, I was perplexed. <laughs> and I was sitting in the pulpit because at that time I had been uh, given a license to preach. And, and of course, uh, I was allowed to read scripture and, and, and go through all of those things that a young minister uh, is allowed to do in service. So I was sitting up there. And I'll never forget that the pastor sermon that he preached that day uh, was entitled, Nothing Can Stop You Now. And by the time he finished preaching that sermon, the Spirit had, uh, had just come upon me in a very heavy way to the point where I had tears uh, coming down my eyes, but also uh, another, uh, more than tears was coming down internally, uh, a sense of peace came down, a sense of resolution came down, uh, a sense of confidence came down. Uh, and so with those tears, uh, I became resolute that this is what God wanted me to do, and I'm going to do it, and I'm going to be the best. Uh, so uh, after that service, uh, with no wavering at all, my mind was clear, 
It was a peace that passes all understanding. I uh, withdrew uh, from my electrical engineering program uh, and uh, I applied to seminary, was accepted. Uh, and at that point in time, all of the things that my head was contemplating resolved themselves. Uh, I was not kicked out of the place that I was staying. My, on my job, I got more hours and an increase in pay uh, that allowed me to continue to pay my bills because, again, I was in school based upon loans. I continued to pay my bills until I went to seminary. And even when I got into seminary, uh, the church made it possible for my tuition to be paid, but I was able to become at the seminary uh, a, I guess you would say, a, a dorm counselor or, or something like that. Uh, and, uh, and, and money came with that. And, and so every need, every issue uh, that I thought uh, prevented me from accepting this call and stepping out on faith uh, in a deep way was resolved. So, uh, and, and, and so the rest, as they say, uh, is history. I uh, continued on to a seminary, uh, became an ordained deacon, an ordained elder in the Amy Church, uh, continued to serve uh, the Amy Church, got my first church, served on staff uh, at a church. Uh, the bishop appointed me at the age of 27 of my first church uh, and had served uh, four or five churches since then. Continued on again uh, with my education uh, got I, I once once I had a resolution when I went to seminary, I knew I wanted to be sort of a scholar pastor uh, and and wanted to be the best. Uh, I did so much work in seminary that they gave me two masters of the one in theology and one in church a administration. Uh, and I only point that out uh, you know, because uh, just to just to display uh, the amount of seriousness uh, that uh, that that peace that I got that confidence that I got, that assurance that I got, that uh, God had called me to this work and, uh, and I wanted to be the best uh, I could be. Uh, so I leaned in very hard. Uh, as the young people say, I went hard in the paint <laughs> and did a lot of work uh, and, and then went on from there. Uh, and I wanted to uh, continue my studies, uh, get a doctorate, and continue that process. Uh, I was accepted uh, some years later into uh, Duke's uh, uh, a THM uh, program uh, and achieved that uh, in record time and then uh, achieved my uh, doctorate uh, from Duke University and eventually uh, was appointed uh, to Cornerstone uh, and now I'm here uh, as the pastor of Wesley. So uh, long and short that is that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Uh, there's a lot of stories that I'll never, never forget. The most profound of stories uh, have to deal with uh, prayer and the way in which uh, prayer and action go together. Uh, I'll lift up one that, because it is germane to uh, the uh, Louisiana Conference in my service uh, at uh, Cornerstone uh, United Methodist Church. Um, I was in my office. I had always uh, began praying, and I, and I was in my office, and I had been praying for some time that we be intergenerational, uh, which means that we needed uh, more young uh, people. We needed uh, young families. Uh, uh, we needed God to trust us uh, with the development of these young families. Uh, and I was praying. I was working in my office. I believe I was either working on a sermon or working on an essay or working on an article. And I just had been praying, you know, how you may be working on something, but you're praying at the same time on something else. Uh, and, and I had been praying, and all of a sudden I heard this noise uh, outside. And the prayer that I was praying was, Lord, we need, we need more young people. Uh, we need young families. And as I was praying, I heard this noise outside, uh, and guess what was outside in the parking lot playing? Two young boys was outside. And I said, okay, God, uh, this uh, is your moving. So I went outside uh, and introduced myself 
to the gentleman. Uh, they were young boys. Um, and, um, and long story short, I gave him my card. I don't know why I did that, but I gave him my card, put a note on the back to the parents. I said, give this to your parents. Uh, let them know that we're here and, and we really like uh, them to come and, and serve with us. And, uh, and, and they're welcomed here. And they were telling me, oh, I live here or I live there. And I just said, okay, all right. Uh, and uh, after a while, um, both uh, boys, uh, they're you're still young now, uh, but, but both boys and their parent, parents, and even their grand, I think one boy's grandparents, uh, started coming to Cornerstone and joined Cornerstone. And, and now uh, the prayer uh, has uh, become reality. Uh, God has answered that prayer. Uh, so, so that is a memory that, one memory of the connection between prayer and action, uh, prayer and planning. Uh, as uh, there's an African proverb uh, that this story and many others, but this one particularly, uh, embodies, and that is you have to put feet to your prayers. Uh, and, and that's a story uh, that, uh, that showed what happens when you put feet to your prayers. Uh, and uh, and I've, uh, I've, that has been one of the ethics of my ministry, uh, to make sure that uh, I put feet to, to my prayers. Maybe we're coming to the last question of your interview. Mm -hmm. um, along this journey, we have a lot of people that, that touch us and, um, you know, that people that we may touch and have mm -hmm. a profound impact on, mm -hmm. um, you know, mentors, uh, church members, family. Sure. Friends. Um, who are you thankful for as you come to this milestone uh, in your life, um, as being in full connection with the United Methodist Church? Um, who are you thankful for? Well, I could give the easy answer. <laughs> I'm thankful for my sons. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for uh, the uh, bishops, two of which uh, believed in my ministry. I'm thankful uh, for the uh, district superintendents, two of which uh, have uh, shown that they uh, are willing to give me an uh, opportunity to serve or, or at least recommend that I have an opportunity to serve uh, my colleagues uh, in the ministry that I've met uh, over uh, over years, uh, uh, but also here in the uh, Louisiana Conference. Those are the easy answers, <laughs> uh, and, and they're true answers. Uh, but I wanted to, or and, I think that it's very important for me to lift up uh, mentors that I've had uh, in the past. I've got a mentor here in Louisiana a Conference, uh, uh, Sean Anglum has been a blessing, but there was another mentor that was an example of a line in one of my favorite poems. It's a poem by a uh, Rudyard Kipling called If, uh, and the poem starts out, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you but make allowance for their doubting too, and it goes on down the line. And one of my favorite lines in that poem is that if you can walk with kings and never lose the common touch. And one of the mentors, uh, Dr. Marvin Crawford and his wife, uh, Sister Crawford, Cheryl Crawford, uh, I am tremendously thankful for because we need examples of these very aloof and high-flying ideals, you know, walk with kings and never lose a common touch. But they were an example to me of what the coming together of power and love looks like. Uh, they, uh, Dr. Crawford and his wife, both of whom are physicians, <laughs> medical physicians, and Dr. Crawford, uh, and they're from small towns, sort of like some of the parishes here, small towns. I mean, people call it backwood, behind God's back <laughs> places, right, uh, that many of us may be uh, from uh, and or, or our ancestors or our elders are from, uh, our families are from. Uh, and, uh, and they showed me, I was able to see uh, the coming together of, uh, of, of power and, and love. Uh, they were they were educated 
They had that power. They had money. They had that power. Uh, they knew people. They had that power. Uh, they had a number of, I guess, reservoirs of power, however you may define it. They, they were embodied. But they never, ever lost the common touch. They, ever, they never did. Uh, they went to a church that was, uh, that was small. Um, they gave of their resources, spent their own money, used whatever resource that they had, whether it be money or their education. Uh, and they never, they, they never ever uh, wavered. Uh, and they didn't get anything, they didn't do it to get anything back. They, they, they did it because God called them to do it. They, they knew where their blessings came from. They, uh, and, and, uh, and, and that is, uh, out of all of the mentors and friends and colleagues that I've had, uh, that example is what I'm thankful for uh, because uh, they remind me uh, of what I owe. We don't think about owing a lot today, uh, but I owe. And they are a perfect example of what I owe. Uh, I owe uh, those who have gone on before, those who uh, may not be as fortunate as I am. I owe, I owe God, I owe Jesus. I, I owe the church that formed me. Uh, and, and, and I thank God for that example of what power and love looks like. Uh, they, uh, they didn't just use all of the blessings that have bestowed, God has bestowed upon them. They just didn't use it for their own self-aggrandizement. Uh, they they tried to use their resources, their time, their talents uh, to, uh, in Jesus' name, uh, make life a little bit better uh, for others and to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ in places that can be very dark sometimes. Uh, but uh, but they didn't. And you and, and so I think I'm thankful for that example of what ministry uh, needs to be, especially those ministers uh, that have education. They they have money, uh, uh, whether or not it be from their own clergy background or <laughs> inheritance or what have you. They have connections and they have power, uh, but they haven't forgotten uh, and, and it's incumbent upon us uh, to use that power uh, to uh, manifest what it means uh, that, uh, that scripture is true, uh, which says, God is love.